Good morning, church family, and happy Easter. Let's sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He died for me. He died for me. He died for me. He's so good to me. He's coming back. He's coming back. Church of Christ, and again, Happy Easter. If you are visiting with us today, and I know we have a lot of visitors, you are our special guests. We hope that you will linger for a few minutes after the service so we can say howdy <laughs> and learn who you are and learn your name and just let you know that you are always welcome with us today. We start our worship service today. Um, I think we have a scripture. I think we have a scripture. We do from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. And altogether, he has risen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Christ the Lord is risen today.
Good morning. I get to welcome you as well. I think we have some people coming in. So if y'all may want to squeeze in just a little bit, if there is, there may not be any room to squeeze, but if there is, if you would do that, I know people would deeply appreciate it. So I'm going to take a little longer than usual with announcements just to, we have so many guests, just so you're aware of who we are and what we're doing and even why we're doing it. So first of all, I'd like to ask you, our members and our guests alike, if you complete the information here in this perforated edge that you can tear off on the printed handout you should have received when you came in this morning, and you can just complete that information and leave it there, and the seat and the staff will pick it up uh, just a little bit later. And additionally, on that attendance slip, one of the things we do on Wednesday night, we eat together. And this Wednesday night, we're going to eat Grump's Burgers together. And so on that attendance slip, if you're going to be here on Wednesday night to eat with us, if you'll just complete that information, how many will be there from your family? That would really be appreciated. We normally have classes for adults and children and teens on Wednesday nights at 6.30, but we're going to do something a little different this Wednesday. We're going to have a Leadership Training for Christ celebration. Our students go to Dallas every year, Easter weekend, normally on that Friday and Saturday, so they returned yesterday. And so we have their awards and a time of celebration to acknowledge the work that our students have done. We'll do that Wednesday night at 6.30. We'll do it right here in the worship center. So we've done communion a little different. One of the things we do here, we participate in communion every week and do for sanitary reasons over the last couple of years, we've done these little portable communion sets and there should be one in the chair right in front of you. If you wanna go on and get that now, we're gonna participate in communion here in just a few moments. You can reach across and get that. We have found that this has been a very convenient and helpful way to participate in weekly communion. I hope that is helpful to you. Another thing that we do as a church is we have a periodic blood drives and that's gonna take place next Sunday the 24th out in the Fellowship Center where you can give the gift of life starting at 8.30 uh, next Sunday morning then we'll be wrapping up right after noon. So one of the things I would say about the Greenberry Church of Christ, we have lots of guests, you know, how would I describe who we are? One of the things I would say is look around and you can tell we're a fairly large church. But another thing that would be characteristic of us as a church family we sort of think and act sometimes like we're a country church as well. Some of y'all come from little small country churches. We have a little bit of that mindset as well. And so with that in mind, one of our students left me a note and left it on the podium and it's, it's good enough, it's worth reading to you. So I'm gonna read it to you. This student left me this note. John, could you please make an announcement about a missing NASA sweatshirt left one week ago? Oh, it gets better. It looks like something an unpaid intern would wear. <laughs> I really thought that was good. I've been that unpaid intern and I had to think back to 1985 and what I wore as an unpaid intern in 1985. So if you'll uh, get that to me, I will make sure that it gets it to, to that student. I thought that was very cleverly worded and we are most definitely have characteristics of the little country church as well as being very large. What a privilege it is to worship and to really focus on the resurrection of Jesus this morning. When you get up in the morning, you don't necessarily know what to expect. In fact, when you get up in the morning, likely you expect anything and everything to potentially unfold on that particular day. You, may, you don't really know what the day may bring. A younger man got up, likely bright and early one morning, he got up one morning and he told his father that he wanted his share of the family inheritance. And by the way, he wanted it now, up front. He wanted his share of the family inheritance before the death of his father. That narrative is revealed in a parable that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 15. And he relates this parable by saying, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now one commentator in reflecting on this parable and specifically reflecting on the request of the younger son says this and I quote, the younger son's request to receive his property during his father's lifetime was irregular and deeply disrespectful. 
It amounted to treating his father as if he were dead. But the father responds, and the story continues. The father responds, he divided his property between them. In other words, between his older brother, whom you're introduced to a little bit later in the parable, he divided his property between them. And this younger man got up and took off and left. Jesus continues the story in the parable in verse 13 of Luke chapter 15. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. So his father continued to get up every single morning. Continued to get up every single morning and face his day, continued to go about his daily routines. And then one morning he got up and everything changed. More on that in my sermon this morning. Welcome, we're really glad that you're a part of our worship experience this morning. Let's sing. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praise. We pause and reflect and take what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. We meet around that, that table that Christ used when he performed the Last Supper. At this special time of the year, there's two special times of the year, I think, when the whole world stops and reflects upon Jesus Christ. That being Christmas, we celebrate his birth, and the Easter weekend, we celebrate his death, burial, and the important part, his resurrection. It was a terrible thing that happened on the cross that day, but for us as sinners, it was the victory that we need that, so that we can live with him, amen? So we're going to sing a song, an old song that I realize we haven't sung this one in a long, long time. Probably not another one that's richer in doctrine for this time of the service. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest 
best and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So up to cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to that home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old Good morning, church. Sometimes when I do this, I keep things brief, I keep things short, I keep it really focused on what uh, it is we're here to do. Today's not that day. So John, I'm not going to take you away your sermon time, I really will not try not to, but I read something the other day that it just, it, it hit me, it impacted me, and I was like, that's it, everything I thought I was going to say this morning, I just kind of put it away a couple days ago. Because of this, and you may have read a similar writing before, um, but this is the one we're going to read today. He received 39 stripes because 40 was known to kill a man. They wanted him alive. They held handfuls of his beard and hair, and he pulled it out by the roots. They wanted him alive. They kicked, punched, spit on him for hours until there wasn't a single spot on his body, not covered in blood. They wanted him alive. They shoved a crown of thorns down on his head so harshly it stuck in his skin. They wanted him alive. After hours of being beaten, mocked, whipped, flogged, and tortured, they made him walk with a cross. They made him carry it, a rough piece of wood with splinters digging into, his, the, digging into the fresh wounds. They wanted him alive. They wanted him to feel, the he they wanted him to feel every ounce of pain they could. He had to feel it in order to heal us. Crucifixion was, not one, crucifixion was historically one of the cruelest, most tortured deaths a human could face. Hours upon hours of torture, torture most of us cannot imagine mentally even think of because of the cruelty isn't normal. It's something our minds cannot comprehend. We celebrate Easter with pastel colors, happy children, hunting eggs and chocolate. Truth is, there's absolutely nothing happy about that day Jesus died. It was cruel, bloody, and nasty. He could have stopped all of it. He could have called every angel in heaven to demolish every single person standing and shouting, crucify him. He didn't. He knew, he knew in order to have a Sunday, you have to have a Friday. He knew in order to have joy, you have to carry out your cross. He felt everything that day. He felt how your heart broke wide open when you had to watch your baby die. He felt how heavy your life was when you're staring down the barrel of a gun wondering if the man you called your husband was going to shoot you. He carried the weight of the burden. You have felt it <clears throat> since your spouse died and life just doesn't seem right since. On that cross, he held the rapists and murderers, the sinners and the saints. He leveled every playing field and said, all of you are worth it. 
He knew you had to carry the cross. He never promised the cross you to carry in this life would, be, would not be heavy. His wasn't. His promise is that Sunday's coming. No matter how heavy Friday is, financially, emotionally, mentally, or physically, Friday is heavy. That cross is weight. The, the cross that weighs you down, and you're about to be crumbled under its weight. His promise, wasn't, was, his promise was simply this. He won't make you carry it alone. What kind of king would step down from his throne for this? Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, did this for you. He did every bit of it for you and for me. Oh, yes, it was heavy. So heavy sometimes you don't think you can take one more step. But look up because Sunday's coming. Sunday's here, amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Father, we ask that at this time we remember that sacrifice and we take this in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name, amen. So I led singing last Sunday, and uh, I'm not fixing to do it again. But um, a song that if we, you know, back in the day, we got the books out, we would say, turn to page number whatever. So this one's 470. The title of it is Victory in Jesus. So everybody here could pretty much sing this song from memory, right? But it kind of hit me. It says, I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. I think sometimes we live our life, we sing this song, we say, I hope to win the victory. I hope. We don't feel like we're worthy of it. Let me tell you, if you don't feel like you're worthy of it, if you don't feel like you're worthy of what Jesus Christ did, then you're minimizing it. We cannot minimize what he did on that cross. And if you're having a life, if you live a life that you think, you know what, I'm just not good enough. God could never forgive me. He could never imagine what I've done. I can't, I can't confess it. I can't. Then we minimize it. And that's, what, that's not what we're about. Because he won the victory. We've won the victory because of his precious blood. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for the blood that was shed. Father, I cannot imagine the pain and agony that Jesus went through. But Father, we thank you for that. And we celebrate his resurrection. We pray that you'll be with us as we take this cup. In Jesus' name, amen.
as we say, we're separate and apart now. We have an opportunity to give back. For our members, they know that their boxes in the corners, you can go online and give. Um, but this is that opportunity that we have. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the blessings, blessings which we are untold, blessings that we don't deserve. Father, we just ask that you help our hearts, our minds as we give. Father, whether it's a penny or a million dollars, it doesn't matter, Father. It's the heart, it's the intent, it's the spirit in which we give. And so we ask that you'll bless these monies that they go to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We have one song before John's lesson today. During the old rugged cross, when the slide fupa happened, that was not Jan's fault. That was mine. I had a senior moment. I forgot how I turned those slides in. So anyway, but we got the message. Let's stand as we sing. I stand. got up one morning. Those who were closest to Jesus got up one morning. And as they got up that morning, I don't think they had any clue, no inkling at all, that before the day would end, that Jesus would be arrested. I don't think they saw it coming, and I think perhaps they were clueless in more ways than one. That night, that very night, Jesus prayed in a garden. It's referred to in the scripture as the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew actually tells us about it in his gospel account. Here's what he says. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. But as I said, clueless 
was the mindset of the day. Keep that in mind as Matthew continues to tell the story. Still in the Garden of Gethsemane, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it wasn't long after that interchange, that moment, that the moment they were not expecting arrived. Still in Matthew's gospel, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. The intensity of this situation soon becomes very evident. In switching to Mark's account in Mark's gospel in chapter 14, then some began to spit at him as he was hanging on a cross, I would add. Some began to spit at him, they blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. And Peter was there. Peter, who had also been in the garden, the same Peter who was clueless, the same Peter who, along with others, was having a very difficult time staying awake as Jesus prayed that he could fulfill the Father's will. Peter was there. And by the way, Peter had been very close to Jesus. He was definitely part of that inner circle that Jesus had, but Peter had no inkling at all that morning when he got up. He got up that morning and he had no idea that he would choke under pressure and do the unthinkable. No idea at all that he would choke under pressure and say the unthinkable as well. Back to Matthew's account in Matthew's gospel. Now, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about. Completely denied that he even knew Jesus ultimately. Perhaps one of the most disturbing reports in this entire scenario, as Jesus is arrested, as Jesus is tried, and ultimately as Jesus is crucified, one of the most disturbing reports in the entire scenario is actually summed up in one short sentence in Matthew's gospel. And that sentence is in chapter 26, verse 56. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. All the disciples, all of them, all who were closest to him, all the disciples deserted him and fled. And when they got up that morning, I honestly don't believe that was their intent. I don't think they got up bright and early that morning thinking, let's desert Jesus, let's take off this person whom we become so close to we have been eyewitnesses of numerous miracles. We know who he is. We know what he teaches. I don't think that was their intent when they got up that morning. But thankfully, what occurs here is by no means the end of the story, as you may very well know. 
The death of Jesus follows shortly after these events surrounding his arrest, his trials, and his crucifixion. But thankfully, his death is by no means the end of the story. Back once again to Matthew's account, he says, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. It was early on a Sunday morning. They got up bright and early. And Matthew tells us there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the tomb, uh, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay and then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So when that group of women got up bright and early that morning, they had no clue that their lives were about to change and that their lives were going to change forever. Jesus proceeded to appear to a, a number of different people in a number of different places following the resurrection. And it'd be interesting to look at all those appearances and some of the dialogues that took place. He even appeared to the apostle Paul much later as Paul said he was abnormally born. But during one of those resurrection appearances, he made sure that he expressed to Peter that all was forgiven and there was definitely going to be a place for Peter to serve. That particular interchange is recorded in John's gospel in John chapter 21. And the text says during this resurrection appearance, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Well, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, and there's some language dynamics going on here. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know that in all things, you know that I love you. Let's press the fast forward button. Let's fast forward very quickly to the general time period following the actual resurrection of Jesus. A group of Jesus' followers got up one morning, and when they got up bright and early that morning, they got up in a very different mindset than they had the day they got up when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke records in Acts chapter 2, and Acts is actually part 1, uh, part 2 from Luke's part 1, and the Gospel of Luke being part 1. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32, he describes their life together in the following way. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but 
They shared everything they had. With great powers, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that they were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Isn't it interesting to note this same group of people who were in the garden with Jesus, this same group of people who deserted it and fled during the arrest and trials of Jesus, they are not the same. This same group that fled following the resurrection of Jesus, they are by no means the same people. In fact, there's, there's an obvious and distinct contrast as Luke records it here in Acts chapter 2. Instead of running away and scattering in every way possible, he describes him as being of one heart and mind. And there's no doubt that there's this unselfish and mutually caring spirit among all of them, all of them. They are truly together in an unprecedented spirit of unity. You know, a country guy like me grew up in West Texas, asked some pretty simple basic questions. And I asked the question, what changed? Why so different? What changed? And I can tell you truthfully what changed. The resurrection of Jesus changed their lives. And here's why. Everything that Jesus told them while he was still with them, as he was interacting with them on a day-to-day -day basis, as he was teaching them, as he was performing various miracles, everything that Jesus told them while he was still with them turned out to be true. Everything he represented, everything he did, turned out to be completely and totally accurate. So it's almost like after the resurrection, it all came together and made sense to them. It's almost like, oh, now the lights have come on in our head. And I think we would all be convinced of the fact when a man is risen from the dead, that's pretty convincing, is it not? When you've been an eyewitness of such a historical event, I believe that would be very, very convincing. Let me turn this around and make it just a little more personal this morning. What about you? Where do you find yourself today? We too, I think much like the disciples of Jesus, I think we too have difficulty sometimes putting everything together. Even if you started being a part of a church setting, you went to Sunday school from the time you were a little bitty and you were maybe part of a youth group in a church setting. Sometimes it's difficult to put everything together that we have learned from scripture or things that we have been taught at church or taught at home to the ears. Sometimes just to, to grasp the big picture, what, what has really occurred? Sometimes just like the disciples, to put it all together and to have that aha moment as they had the aha moment, sometimes it's a challenge. Because we hear bits and pieces here, we hear bits and pieces there, and sometimes we have a difficult time assembling all that information and saying, oh, here is the true, accurate telling of the gospel story. I think if the truth be known, probably all of us are more like Peter than we want to admit and more like the other disciples than we want to admit. When the heat is turned up, I suspect we too would be tempted to desert and run and run as fast as we can. So I would ask you again today, where are you today? Where do you find yourself today? And when you got up this morning on this beautiful Sunday, this beautiful resurrection Sunday, when you got up this morning, 
what was on your heart? What was on your heart first and foremost as you got up this morning? When I stood up here a little bit earlier in our service during our announcements and call to worship, I made reference to a young man who got up and in the most offensive way asked his dad, said, I'd like to have my inheritance. I want it up front. I know you haven't died. I know you're still alive, but I, I want my money. I, can't, I want it really right now. And things over a period of time changed for him. A desperate and despondent young man got up one morning and he said this back to the parable in Luke chapter 15 where we began this morning. Says he came to his senses. I suspect all of us have been there before. I can recall coming to my senses. Sometimes you come to your senses when you're young. Sometimes you can be a little older and come to your senses too. And it says when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he went back and went to his father. And how do you suppose his father reacted? This younger son has really wished that he was dead for all practical purposes. He'd been very offensive and asking for his share of the inheritance. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, the father got up that morning as well, totally and completely unaware of what was about to unfold. And Jesus tells us in this parable in reference to this son, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Let me tell you, Jewish men of that era did not run that was considered to be improper. That was just not, it was unheard of. And he literally dropped everything and ran to his son. You got up this morning. You're here this morning. In some cases, some of you might've been drugged here this morning. Anybody get drugged here this morning? But. You got up this morning and you're here and I would ask one more time, where do you find yourself? Perhaps like this young man, discouraged, despondent might be an appropriate word as well. In a state of failure or maybe full of regret, feeling rejected, maybe even feeling a sense of hopelessness on a beautiful spring day. Jesus related this parable of the prodigal son as it's sometimes been called. I think it could be appropriately renamed the parable of the loving father. Nevertheless, he relayed this parable in Luke chapter 15 as a way of getting across to his hearers that God loves and God loves unconditionally at all times. This father, this Jewish man portrayed in this parable is symbolic of our own heavenly father who runs, he runs to us and he loves us unconditionally to the point that he sent his son to die on our behalf. So the resurrection of Jesus is solid confirmation that what Jesus said and did is completely and totally true. So the gospel story is true. And God's unconditional love for each of us is true and accurate in every sense. 
What a blessing it has been to hear the very essence of the gospel message this morning. So Kirk will lead us an invitation song and we'll stand and we'll sing. We'll offer you an opportunity to respond. You may be, I'm ready to confess the Lordship of Jesus. I want to be baptized. We'll, we'll do that. I actually had somebody tell me right before services this morning to, to get to the point because they had Easter egg hunting to do. I probably should tell you that individual who told me that is in their 80s. <laughs> but we would not want to post an 80-year-old Easter egg hunting, but we got time. Let's stand and sing this morning. One day. lesson today. We did our Easter egg hunting yesterday and I got my share. No, not really. Uh, it's been a joy to be in the Lord's house today. Amen. amen. We're glad to see everyone, like I said at the beginning. Uh, if you have a moment, just uh, if you're visiting with us or if you see someone that you don't know, go up and say, howdy. <laughs> or at least, so glad you got to see me today. We want to welcome you back to the Granbury Church of Christ at your every convenience and hope that what we have done today was a blessing to us, of course, but more so a blessing to God. He is our audience. We're going to uh, sing one more song and then Fidel Quesada, one of our shepherds, will lead us in a dismissal prayer. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Unto the Lord, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise on to the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth. From the depths of the sea, let all creation.
nation praise his name from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise his name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord, shout hallelujah unto the You know, the story never gets old. I don't know how many times I've heard the story of, of what happened, took place on Easter Sunday, the, the moments that before, and it just, it just fascinates me. It's like I'm hearing it for the first time each and every time. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, visitors, for being here with us this morning. Uh, we appreciate your, your presence, and we ask the Lord to, to bless you. Uh, make sure you pick up an announcement sheet uh, when we want to remember our members that, who are on it. And we also, I want to point out that uh, being on the missions committee, we've got a couple of mission trips coming up in, in June and July. One is to the Casa de la Esperanza in Anahuac, Mexico. The other is in Far, Texas, the, the uh, Tex South Texas Hispanic Ministries. Uh, so I want, I want everybody to, re, to repeat after me. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. That means good morning. Dios es, amor. Dios es amor. That means God is love. You are not bilingual. <laughs> You're invited to go on either one of those trips. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you have blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship we've had this morning. For this, your son who gave himself willingly that we might live not just to start a new day each and every day, but for all eternity. We pray and, and a special blessing on our, our visitors, uh, our members, uh, all of those that are with us worshiping online and, and all over the world, Heavenly Father, who remember this first day of the week. We celebrate that each and every first day of the week, and it's through his name that we pray. Amen.